Everybody hear me? Is that okay? Okay. Good morning, children of God. I've been looking all week. I've been looking forward to today. Amen. I have been. For two reasons, for worship and for fellowship. Amen. I've been looking forward to get here in this space. I was so anxious to meet with God and worship, to sing, to pray, to listen to his spirit, and to get to know you. Is that all right? Amen. Let's get to know you this morning. Um, I would like to begin first by recognizing the presence of um, our former provo at Northern Caribbean University, um, Dr. Evelyn Tucker and her husband. They are here. I'm sure there might be others, but I've been, ah, hi. Dr. Tucker, could you wave for us, please? Good. Dr. Tucker just retired here recently. Could we make her welcome? Amen. And she's here this morning. Um, Brother Tucker, can you wave to us as well, please? Good. And I see there's a little one beside you waving. I, don't, I, I have not met that one as yet. But um, they are here. I have been meeting a number of friends who are living here in the Houston area. And um, traveling throughout this week, uh, God has given us a tremendous opportunity here in Houston. Amen. Is that all right? Amen. You as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church know that you are not just another this is not just another church. And you are not just another member, and this is not just another worship. There's a reason why God has called you, why he has called us, and why he has established us. Our purpose here is to know God and to make him known, to know him on Sabbath in worship, and also to make him known throughout the week. Is that all right? That's our purpose. I don't know how far I'm going to go in today's message because I have a lot to say. And we have a lot to hear. While I am here to worship and to fellowship and to get to know you, I know that there's a reason why God has planted us as a church. Amen. And why we are here. We are not just another denomination. We are the remnant church with a specific message. And we have to pass that on to our young people. So here in Houston, I'm not just here in Houston. I am here because I'm convicted that God wants me to be here. Amen. And you should be too. Amen. This is his leading, and that's why, why we, are, we, are, we are here. It's been a big week. It's been quite a week. It's, a, it's been a big journey. And I hope that you have learned to trace God's hand in your life. Yes, you know, the, life, the, the hand of God, I can share my testimony with you. Amen. You know, um, this all started when I was supposed to head out to Mexico back in July. I, was, I have now moved from the, from the professor's desk to the pulpit. Um, I was supposed to head over to Mexico, and in going over to Mexico, I moved from Mexico into um, Atlanta. And in Atlanta, I had a conversation with a number of our leaders that took me, that, that started this process. I came here for the interview um, in October, and then I went back, and it's been a whirlwind ever since. Then last Friday, I came here to Houston. Houston is a, is a new route for me. So I came to Houston last Friday, met you on Sabbath, and started the process of learning the city of Houston on Sunday, learning your highways and finding out about Houston. Texas is a different animal. <laughs> Uh, I was um, in meeting with the, with the uh, what they call them again, the Homeland Security folks on Monday and the conference, and then Tuesday had to go to the conference office for logistics and for training and for legal exposure and for a number of things, and to know where the conference office is, is the first I have ever had a place of work four hours away <laughs> by car. And I have to learn all of that, you know, in terms of driving to the conference. And then four hours back, and then four hours of training. Interesting. Yes. And then finding apartment. But I have a home. Amen. I have my own key. Amen. Not, in the, Amen. not in the hotel anymore. Amen. Uh, I don't like hotels. You know, so now I have my own key, and the Lord is good. Amen. So far, everything is settled. The only thing I need to get now is a car. If anyone has a nice, beautiful car to give me, I can drive. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there. Putting it out there. Putting it out there. Putting it out there. But God is good. I want to apologize again for Pastor Dr. Elton 
um, who should have been with us last week, who was supposed to do the installation and the introduction on behalf of the conference, the secretary of the conference. Um, he came down with the flu last Sabbath morning. He has been ill all week, and I learned that there's a flu epidemic going on. So, so early in the week when I felt my sore throat, I, I don't know what you use while they have pills and all that kind of stuff. Yes, I got some vitamin C, but I grabbed the garlic and got made about four or five tablets from the raw garlic and drank it like a pill. And then they, because I don't want to get sick, not just yet. I, maybe six months from now, I, 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 can, I, can, I can get sick, but I want to settle first. And then this coming week while I was at the conference office, I learned that this coming week, Tuesday for the rest of the week, they'll be having their pastor's meeting, which is one, I don't know where it is, but I'll find it. By God's grace, it's for three days, I think they meet twice per year. So I'll be gone for this week. Our routine as a church will begin. Um, I will probably start settling properly here at our church um, on Thursday, Friday. When I come back from the past, from the from 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 the conference, from the pastors' meeting, that is where I'll be meeting most of the persons I'll be working with. Is that all right? So I'm asking you to to whisper a word of prayer. But right now, you know, sometimes you get apprehensive, wouldn't you? I mean, I know that it was from Mexico to Atlanta to here, back home, then I transitioned, and I'm here now. So sometimes you get uh, um, apprehensive. And one morning this week, I think the first night I slept in my apartment on the earbed. Um, first I've ever slept in an earbed, bought that Walmart, blew it up. Um, in the night, you know, God's spirit comes to you. Are you familiar with that? And um, he speaks into you, if you will listen. He started out with a song. I was sleeping. Then a beautiful hymn began. And I knew that I was not alone. Amen. And I woke up and um, the Lord, you know, he said something to me. I want to share it. Is that all right? Yes. He said, you know, don't allow your space to occupy your spirit. But allow your spirit to occupy your space. Amen. I want to share it. That's powerful. Yes. Don't allow your space to occupy your spirit, but allow your spirit to occupy your space. It reminded me of a, a quote I read that says, don't allow people to pull you into their storm, but pull them into your peace. Amen. Or we like to say, don't allow anyone to take your joy, Amen. especially when you're a child of God. Amen. And then he, he said to me, one, you now have a new family. They are the Houston International members. So you're my brothers and sisters. And you're going to meet a number of new friends like the Tuckers and about four or five others that have contacted me so far across Houston. And I am with you. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God is with us. And so we are going through a lot of changes, but it's clear as a pastor that I need to um, know why I'm here. I am convinced that this is where the Lord wants me at this time. And I'm open to his leading and open to whatever he's saying. Traveling across the cities, uh, city of Houston, I drove to the airport yesterday all by myself. Nice. You know, I've been having piloting since. I have some friends taking me around. But I just, I just asked one of the, um, where, where I am, I asked the guy who was cleaning the directions, and it was simple. So I got on the highway and enjoyed. So I'm learning the city of Houston, and I'm seeing how diverse it is, how richly and beautifully diverse, and how much God wants us to do something for him Amen. here as we worship. So I'm here to speak to you about that today. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to two passages of scripture that we will use for this morning's meditation. And I'll read them in your hearing. If you are very familiar with them, one, I'm reading from the New Living Translation until my stuff arrives. This is the Bible, I, my reading Bible for now, so that's what I have. Um, and I'm, we're reading from Luke chapter 2 first, and then we'll be looking at St. John chapter 9 and verse 4. I'd like you to hold those two passages of scripture while I pray. Father God, we know your presence is here. This is your holy word, and this is your moment. I invite your Holy Spirit now to 
come and accompany your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Allow me to read the context. New Living Translation, it says, Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, 12 years old. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed that he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him. Three days later, that's a sermon, they finally discovered him in the temple sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantically searching for you everywhere. And Jesus re replied, But why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Can you say amen? amen. Why didn't you need to search? Didn't you know that I must be about my fa father's business? The second passage of scripture is in St. John chapter 9. And I like it from the King James Version, but this is what I have. It says, St. John chapter 9 and verse 4. And I'd like you to insert yourself into this passage. It says, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. Can you say amen? amen. The night is coming. And then no one can work. The King James says that I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. I don't, I know you all know that God's coming is close. The signs are everywhere. Earlier this year, uh, I had an experience. Um, there's a good friend of mine, Pastor McCoy. We were very, very close for many years. And um, he had an accident, was driving. Um, you know, Pastor McCoy, if you know him, he has a tremendous love for the Lord. And there was this church, that uh, Anian Town Church in Jamaica, that um, was struggling for many years to be completed. And uh, he decided to go up there to finish the church. And he was dedicated himself, dedicating himself to the church. And what I found interesting, we learned this later, is that um, his wife told it, is that uh, when the church ran out of money, he started using his own money to finish the church. And when he ran out of money, now his wife is learning this after, because <laughs> he didn't discuss it with her. He went to the bank and started borrowing money against his name to finish the church. Are you hearing me? Yes. That is commitment. Mm -hmm. He was dedicated to finishing this church. And while coming home one evening, um, he was driving. I don't know what happened, but he had an accident. Crashed, broke his leg in three places. And uh, he went to the hospital. Everything was fine. He was at home. And I was in cast, and I decided to visit him, and we spent an entire day talking. Then shortly after, he had to go back to the hospital to remove the cast. Now, this is a tall guy. He's about 6'4", maybe 230 pounds, strong, powerful fellow. And decided to go back to the hospital to, to remove the cast. So he texted me and said, I'm going to the hospital. I'm not taking it seriously, just moving the cast, right? So I said, as soon as you get out of the hospital, give me a call, and I'll come by and I will come see how you're doing. I remember lying in my bed when about four o'clock, I heard a text came in, but I didn't pay it any mind. So I got up in the morning to go running, and I picked it up and saw the text that says, Pastor McCoy is dead. 
Now, I, I, I didn't know what to do with that. This is now 6 o'clock in the morning. He just went to take off his cast. So I went jogging. It came from the conference, from the communication department, so it's legit. And I didn't call his wife. I didn't do anything. I just went running and started weeping as I listened to the Spirit of God. Then I went back to see his family to find out what happened. No one knew what happened. He went to remove the cast. The doctor took off the cast, and he went into a, a situation, I guess. I don't know. We thought it was heart attack when we did the autopsy. No heart attack. We thought it was a blood clot. No blood clot. We have checked a number of things. Nothing. No one was prepared for that death. This man is about 46 years old, very healthy, bled heavily after the accident. The doctor said you should have passed out. He didn't pass out. Powerful guy. We still don't know why he died. Makes no sense. Just to take off the cast, he's dead. But it was a wake-up call for the entire conference. It's a wake-up call for those of us who are at the university said it could have been us. It could have been us. It could have been any one of us. I, I remember at the funeral service um, when there was a particular friend of ours of the church, not a, not a pastor, when he heard the story, the testimony of his wife, his wife stood there and she was telling what happened, when, what she was finding out when the bank's calling and uh, everything is going on. A, a gentleman got up and said, listen, honey, don't worry about it. I will clear all his debt. And as long as you and your daughters are in need, you will never suffer. He's a multimillionaire. So he cleared all the debt. He said, I've never seen such commitment. And this is the least I can do. But financially, you'll never suffer. Amen. So he took care of that. But, but the takeaway is, it woke us up because it could have been any one of us. It could have been any one of us in the ministry. It could have been any one of us in the church. It could have been anyone. And it brought me back to the text that I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And we have to be clear as to why we are here as members of God's church. Can you say amen? amen. We have to be clear. I don't know if I'm going to finish this um, a, a, a sermon today. So we have Elder Jeff here. Wherever I reach at 12.30, stop me. If we have to go into a part two, fine. But we cannot view this year, 2018, and the changes that are occurring in the world as members of God's remnant church as business as usual. We have to be about our father's business. Christ was dedicated to his father's business. Amen? Amen. He was. He's 12, at 12 years old. I won't even bother ask for the 12-year-old to stand. But Christ was dedicated to his father's business. I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Could you say that as a church? I must what? Could I hear it? I must? We're going to try it again until we get it right. I'm going to be a choir leader right now. Let's go again. I must. Amen. That's John chapter 9, verse 4. One more time. John 9, verse 4. Let's say that. John. I want you to say it because as you travel throughout this week and Satan send a number of words to your mind, I want these words to be in your spirit. Amen. I want these words to stand strong Amen. in you. These are the words from Jesus. In, when he was speaking to his disciples, he said in John 9 verse 4, I must say it with conviction. Let's try again. I must
Amen. I must work the work of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Jesus, when he left here, not so long ago, he gave us, was read earlier in the scripture, he gave us a commission. He gave us a mission. He said uh, that we should go into all the world. And I think that somehow as a church we're forgetting the commission. But I must go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be, Matthew chapter 8, 28, verses 18 to 20. And he that believeth not shall be damned. And the others I won't touch. When Christ came in Revelation chapter 1 and spoke to John, or when he gave the prophetic commission to the remnant church. We'll talk about that later. Now, as I begin, I would like to call us to unity and to prayer. Jesus, when he was here, he said to his disciples that they, when he was praying in John chapter 17 to his father, on behalf of his disciples, he said to his father, I pray that they may be what? As you and I are. Now, the reason why Christ prayed that prayer is that he know the devil and he know the human spirit. And he knew that this unity will destroy the commission. So he said, I pray that they may be one. Amen. As you and I are one. As I am in you and you are in me, then they'll allow me to be in them. Christ would not have prayed that if he didn't know us. Jesus knows us. We are quick to disunity because of sin. And so he said, that, I pray, he wants us to be united. Because once we are united, we are unstoppable. Amen. As a people and as a church. Disunity should never be in the house of God. The only thing we need to fear as a church in accomplishing the Father's business is disunity. This unity among friends, this unity among families, this unity among spouses, this unity in church. Once we are divided, we are conquered. United we stand. Divided we fall. And the devil knows how to divide and conquer. No man is an island. No man stands alone. The more support you have as a Christian, the easier it is for you to be spiritual as a Christian. Amen. The more united we are as a church, the faster we will grow Amen. and accomplishing the Father's business. Amen. We cannot be disunited. And I want to call us to prayer as well. Because here is something. Probably will not get to the full sermon today, but wherever I reach at 12.30, I'm stopping. I'll continue next week. Prayer is important. You know, I've learned this the hard way. I've, sometimes you have too much education. And most of our education are secular. So we are drifting away from our spiritual foundations. But I've discovered that we, can, we only get what we pray for. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. If you want something, pray for it. If you don't pray for it, you tend not to get it. Because if we don't ask God, Ellen White says in her book prayer, that God cannot answer prayers that are not prayed. Are you hearing me? Whatever you want from God, get on your knees and pray for it. I remember when I just returned to Jamaica in 2011 from Atlanta, I was talking to, in the city of Mandeville, where we were, I thought there was, that was, there was a tremendous potential for the growth of the Adventist church even further. And I, con I, 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 I had a conversation with the pastor for a church in that area, and I said, let's plant a church. I identify a group of persons who are searching for church and individuals who are searching for God, a number of returning residents who wanted to worship in a particular setting, about 600 of them. I identified it and I said, let's plan a church. The pastor was interested. So we decided to go over to a church nearby and to consult, not an Adventist church, and to rent that church in that particular locale and to plant the church. In conversation with the pastor, he was motivated, he was interested, and everything in the conversation went well. I got back to the pastor's office right there in Mandeville, and I dis a, a, a call came in from my prayer partner. Now I have a powerful prayer partner. I'll talk to you more about her next time. 
When the call came in, I said to, the, to, 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 to my poor partner in front of the pastor on the phone, I told her about what we have done, and I asked her if we could pray together for the success of this church planting. And after sharing that with her, she was about to begin to pray, and in the first sentence of her prayer, she stopped. She's praying across the phone. And she said, Dr. Ron, before you and pastor so-and-so went to consult about this church planting, did you talk to God about it? I was ashamed. I said, uh, no. We, we, we hadn't prayed about it. And she said, I'm not going to pray because God said it is not going to happen. Eight o'clock that evening, the pastor called me from the other denomination. And he said, I met with the church board and they voted it down. You cannot have the church. I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson. Since that time, there's nothing I go after without getting on my knees Amen. and talking to God about it Amen. until I feel satisfied in my spirit yes. that he's with it and that he's leading. Amen. That was the takeaway for me. Amen. If you don't pray about it, you will not have it. And sometimes we say we want things. But if you know a church is serious about wanting something, they will unite in prayer over it. Amen. If they are not praying for it, God is not with it. And we are moving in our own strength. Because prayer reveals our hearts. Prayer reveals whatever we want. But there is something about prayer. It's powerful. It moves the hand of Almighty God. Can you say amen? I'm looking forward to the time when one of us will go to the doctor and the doctor say that you're sick, you have cancer, and that person will come here, husband, wife, children, and kneel here. And as a church, we lay hand on that person. Amen. And take, ask God to remove the cancer. Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. According to your faith, beat unto you. Yes. These days, um, sometimes when I have a situation and I go to persons to pray, if your faith is not strong, depending on what I'm going through, I don't pray over me. <laughs> there are some persons when they pray, God, according to your will. No, no, it's not really that they mean it. They are just not sure if you are going to be healed. And many times in the dialogue, you can know the level of that person's faith. I don't, if I go to the doctor and the doctor said, I have terminal cancer. And I come into this church and ask you to pray for me. I don't want you to if and but. I want you to put your hand on me and say, God, in the name of Jesus, heal him. Stop right there. And believe that God will heal. Our job is to ask and leave the answer to God. But not to try to control the answer. Just ask. He said ask. And it is his job to say yes or no or I have something better in mind. But we need to learn. Sometimes we, we wonder if I'm, if, I, if, if I'm righteous enough for God to use me. Just ask. And leave the rest to him. Can you say amen? amen? Prayer moves the hand of God. And we all have testimonies to that. When we pray, we have to give up control. And you say amen. amen. When you pray, you have to give up control. Yes. You turn it over. to. G we like to control him. But there's nothing that we can control. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And there's nothing that Satan fears more than prayer. Ellen White says that the devil trembles when he sees the weakest sinner on his or her knees. If you are going to a situation or you're struggling and you get down on your knees to pray, that's when Satan struggles. Allow me to illustrate this. You know, um, I, I need three persons. Can I have three quick volunteers, please? Good, 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 good. Let's say that uh, uh, I need three. Can you stand on this side? Right up here, please. 
And, and, and you can stand on this side. Good, 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 good. And I need you right at the mic here. Let me illustrate this. I'm following the spirit today. No, I like your suit. Look good. And you're handsome. You are going to represent the devil today. So, so you're a handsome devil. Is that all right? Good. You're representing us in need of prayer. Is that all right? And you're representing the angels or the presence of God. Whenever we do not pray, Satan comes close. And uh, God stays right here. Are you with me? That's when we do not pray. But when you begin to pray, the devil has to go further and God... Go no, not so fast. Not so fast. Not so fast. Not so fast. When you begin to pray, the more you pray and the more you talk to God, the closer he gets. Now, the closer God gets, the further he goes. But when you cease to pray, when you are not praying as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a church worker, as a pastor, as a member of the church board, the less you pray and the more you depend on yourself, the further he goes and the closer he gets. And you know what happened. Thank you very much. Nothing that Satan fears more than prayer. You get a new car, pray. You got a new house, pray. Pray God in. We are Christians. Can you say amen? You get a new job, pray. You get a new family, pray. You're having difficulty with your children, pray. Lay hand sometime on them and pray. Because prayer moves us off from our agenda onto the agenda of God. Yeah. Now here's where I'm going. There's a challenge facing the Father's business that is a concern to me today. And I want to lay the foundation. The church of the 21st century where we are is facing a different challenge than the church of the 1st century. Can you say amen? Yeah. I am concerned. I'm concerned about a number of things. For the past many years, I've been training pastors. No, I'm no longer training pastors. I'm now at the pulpit. I'm doing what I'm training them to do. But I'm aware the research says that the church of the 21st century is facing a different challenge. Our responsibility is not the conference, not the union, not the general conference. It is right here at Houston. International Seventh-day Adventist Church. Can you say amen? amen? And it's not how you see yourself. It's how God sees you. Yes. We need to take our eyes off ourselves and put it on Jesus. Amen. That was Peter's problem. As long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he could walk on water. No, no, you have to... Un I'm tempted to preach. But you have to understand what was going on, you know. Peter in the boat, it was a storm. You ever been into a storm? You just had one recently. Darkness everywhere. Wind and wave and lightning and a storm on the sea. That's not cool. But in that situation, Peter saw Jesus walking on water. And he, they were afraid, of course. But he said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. Can somebody say amen? amen? It is dark. It is lightning. It is a storm on the sea. And Peter, without thinking, without exercising any scientific reason or control or higher education, stepped out of the boat. <laughs> in the storm, on the water. And started walking to Jesus. Amen. Mercy. Amen. Then after a while, reason kicked in. Yeah. But it is dark. <laughs> this is water. <laughs> this, is, this is not logical. Or scientific or reasonable or rational. And he began to sink. 
and he's going to be destroyed. But he cried out. He had sense enough to say, Jesus, yes. that always happened to us. Yes. Lord, save me. And Christ reached out immediately, the Bible says. Amen. I could sit down and grabbed him and pulled him up and said, why did you doubt? Our problem is that we tend to take our eyes off Jesus. We can walk on water as long as we keep our eyes on Christ. Yes. The devil's job is to take our eyes off Jesus. You know, someone says, Jack Welch, that is, when the rate of change outside an organization is greater than the rate of change inside, the end is near. The change that is happening in America, in the world, is massive. Am I right? Hard to keep up with. But within the church, we can become complacent, and we are getting complacent. We'll become comfortable inside. But when the rate of change outside is greater than the rate of change inside, the end is near. It will be just a matter of time. The normal posture of organization at risk. You remember Barnes & Noble? Barnes & Noble is their borders. You remember borders? Yeah. Just recently on Kmart and JCPenney, there was a time they were booming. Yeah. Borders, for instance, was booming. And I think Barnes is also on the risk because of Amazon. But the number of change that was occurring on the outside, because we are so established, there's no need to worry. They have disappeared. And you know, it says the normal posture of an organization is there in a meeting. And they said, what if we don't change at all and something magically happened? Many times that's the behavior of people on the inside. Change is critical. I like this quote, technology won't replace teachers, but teachers who use technology will probably replace teachers who do not. <laughs> if you want to change, you have to be willing to become uncomfortable. Can somebody say amen? amen. Because change comes with prophetic growth. Now let's get to the church. The Seventh-day Adventist church, we are an eschatological, big word, and a prophetic community. It just means that our business is to deal with the last day events. And we are a church of prophecy. God has entrusted us with that responsibility. Can you say amen? amen. We don't have time to get into What's the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist church? The purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist church, simply put, is to be custodians, guardians, and preachers of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Amen. Silence in the church. But the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist church is that we are the custodians. We are, God knew that in the last days, those prophecies would disappear from most churches, and most churches, they are gone except us. And so he raised up the remnant church for a particular reason. Can you say amen? Yeah. The purpose of Seventh-day Adventist ministry is to preach the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist organization is the same. The purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist members is to study and know the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Yeah. Amen. I have the silence going on, but that's all right. I taught at a university for a long time, and as I shared with you before, most of the students that come from Seventh-day Adventist homes are doctrinally illiterate and biblically illiterate. They knew all the science and the geography and the chemistry and the math and the physics, but they don't know the Bible, and they don't know what you believe. And they come to our schools. I'm not talking about those who go to public schools. And I'm blaming the elders and the pastors and the parents. Where is the flock? What sense does it make to gain the whole world and to lose your children? But we are, let me leave, let me move on. How are we doing? Are we improving as a church here in Houston? Or are we declining? Now, there are four challenges facing the master's business. Are we okay? I'm stopping at 12.30. Generational challenges, hidden worldviews, open worldviews, and evangelistic methods. Are you hearing me? 
We are here to promulgate, to do evangelism. We are here as an Adventist church to lead people using the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation to God, to preach the last day events. But as a church, we are facing four challenges. Let me touch them quickly. Number one, generational challenges. Within our church, we have four, sorry, two, four, how many is that? Seven, Seven generations. They are the builder's generation, those who were born before the war, before 1945. They are the baby boomers, they are going into retirement now, those who were born after 1945. They are the baby busters, those who were born in the 60s, that's my generation. They are the generation Y, those who were born in the 70s. They are the millennials, those who came on in the 90s. And there's the dot-com generation, the ones that are born now. Are you listening to me? Yes. I have a little friend with a, he's not two yet. The baby is not two as yet, can't speak as yet. But he can pick up the iPad. He knows what icon to touch. He knows where to find the pictures. He knows how to flip the pictures and then smile. And I have a learning curve when it comes to learning the technology. And he's not two. That's a dot-com generation. All of those generations are within the church. And they are different in numbers. They are different in focus. They are different in listening. They are different in knowledge of the technology. They are different in their knowledge of God. But the generation that is now moving into leadership or in their 20s. Are you hearing me? They are called the millennials. They are the largest generation in the society and also within our church, and they are important. Amen. Why are millennials important? Let, let's read this. You need to, this, is a, this, this, I, this I got recently. The reason why hotels no longer carry Bibles in their bedside drawers. You remember that? When you stay at any hotel, you used to pull the drawer and there's a Bible. Yes. That is disappearing. Bibles are disappearing from hotel drawers across the country, according to a survey from SRT, a hospitality analysis company. Over the past decade, 15% of hotels have stopped providing in-room religious material. In 2006, almost every, in 2006, not so long ago, almost every single hotel, 96%, put a Bible in their bedside drawer. Today, the number is only 79%. Now, most major hotels, franchise, allow individual hotel owners to decide whether to or not to stock their drawers with religious scripture. As, and as more hotel chains aim to attract millennial travelers, are you hearing me? <laughs> they are taking Bibles out of the rooms. When Marriott opened its new Moxie and Edition hotels, they decided they wouldn't put any religious books in the room because the books doesn't fit the personality of the brand. A spokesman told Los Angeles Times, Millennials are the least religious generation in America. And we have a lot of millennials in this church. Amen. They are also the ones, they are also one of the most highly targeted marketing demographics. Gideon International, a group responsible for distributing Gideon Bible, was only formed in 1899 when two Christian salesmen ended up sharing a hotel room. It wasn't until 1908 that they began providing hotels with Bibles. Talk about evangelism. Whenever a new hotel would open in town, a member of the organization would meet with the managers and present them with a free copy of the Bible. And they would then offer to furnish every room of the hotel with a copy. By 1920, the name Gideon had become synonymous with free Bible distribution. Can you say amen? amen? Other religious groups like the Mormons began offering hotels their own religious literature to compete in the night, to complete the nightstand drawer. Some hotels began stocking texts of multiple religions. Now there's a new millennial focus amenity that comes standard. About 98% hotels now offer Wi-Fi. <laughs> the market, and here as we preach, the market on the outside, the secular market, are targeting your kids. Yes. Well, they're not your kids. They are targeting millennials. Whenever they want to make a blockbuster movie, are you hearing that? They target young millennials, male, 
Once the young male millennials like it, the girlfriends will come along and they will go in droves and they will make a blockbuster. But if they target older generation, they make less money. Are you hearing me? Yes. The millennials also control social media. Yes. <laughs> Yahoo and Google and all those things are controlled by the millennials. Are you hearing me? But the millennials is the most secular of all the generations. They are bold and they are irreverent. Are you listening to me? Yes. But they are the most tolerant of all the generations of secular values. The things that offend you don't offend the millennials. With the millennials, there are no absolutes. You have your truth and I have my truth. Some time ago in one of our churches, I had an experience right here in North America. I remember exactly where I was driving. And I got a call that I need to come see some youngsters in a particular church. And I remember when I went there, they were the AY council. The leader decided that He's going to one of our secular, one, not our schools, a public university, and he said, I'm gay. Are you hearing me? Yes. But he's from Jamaica. He's not an American. <laughs> but he has come here, he's now AY leader, and he declared to his AY council that he's gay. I know with my pastoral self was invited to have a prayer with the council, the AY council. Not in Texas, I wasn't here, but in our church. I remember when I sat there and I began talking to them, the AY group council said to me, what is wrong with you? We don't have any problem with it. You need to go back to Jamaica. Because we're tolerant now. And I couldn't find a large percentage of the AY council members who had a problem with that. So I had to make an executive decision. Are you hearing me? Yes. It is here. It is not just out there. But the question is, what is it that millennials want? What is it that your children want? What is it that the college Adventists want? They want to be involved. Can somebody say amen? Yes. And they want inspiration. Yes. That's what they want. And so as a church, we cannot do church and leave them out because the devil will create a room for them sometimes i know that those from my generation or the older generation we like control but we do that to our own peril we have to get them involved i remember i had this experience recently and i'm going to stop here uh some time ago when i was at earlier when i pastored as pastor couple of years back at Northern Caribbean University again as a church pastor and I thought we were having great church church was full but on Sabbaths under the gazebos were a number of young people and I used to wonder why they wouldn't go in church so one Sabbath I walked over to them and I said why is it that you guys are not in church and their response shocked me they said because church is boring now, I <laughs> For me, church was good. I was having great, I did not expect that answer. So I decided that I'm going to, I, I said, hey, okay, I want to see how you guys do church. Seeing that church is boring and I've exhausted all my imagination in making church as meaningful as possible. I am going to, there was, there, there was, there was a, a, a hall on the campus. On Sabbath, I'm going to create a junior church. And all high schoolers will go to that church. And then let me see how you do church. And I did. In no time it was full. Because they formed their own elders, their own deacons, their own Sabbath school. They had their own board. I got an outside youth pastor. Are you hearing me? These are persons between 12 and 18. And when I attended their board meetings and listened to them um, enforce discipline, they were severe. <laughs> Because they're thinking black and white. But because they made the rules themselves. And they were enforcing the rules themselves. And this is their church. And they are involved. 
they cooperated. Amen. If I were to enforce those rules, they would leave. They would leave. And the church exploded. And I learned a lesson. And I tried it again. Elsewhere, and it has worked. The millennials want to be involved. Can you say amen? amen. They want to be involved. We have to let them be a part. Amen. Now, if the secular people can have sense enough to realize where our young people are, and trying to target them, then we have to do something. Or else we are going to lose our children. Amen. And we're losing them. Yes. It's breaking my heart. But if we don't stop as adults, as members of the generation Y and the baby busters and the baby boomers generation, if we don't stop and look at this thing, then shortly from now, we're going to have a church filled only with old people. Or, or... The youngsters will take over. But they will bring, they will give you a church that is not Adventist. And you would have lost the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Would have lost Adventism. Would have lost a remnant mission. And we become a nice little club that have something on Sabbath. I'm not going any further. It is something to pray about. Can you say amen? Yeah. And so we need to unite amen. and to pray. Amen. It is not business as usual. Jesus, when he was here, said, I must be about my father's business. Amen. We as members of God's church must be about our father's business. Can you say amen? amen. And recognize what is going on around amen. us. Or else we are going to become anachronistic and outdated. And just a little group that gather here and there. The church in North America is dying. Let me end on that. This is my area. We have 20 million Adventists in the world. 20 million. 19 million of those Adventists are outside of North America. We have 1 million Adventists in North America. We are tiny. One million. But there are 320 million people in North America. And one million Adventists. And among that Adventist, here it is, 600,000 of that group, more than half are immigrants. People coming from all over the world into North America. Only 400,000 of them are Native Americans. Black American and White American. The church is dying in North America. And for the past 30 years, Native Americans have grown in the Adventist church by minus 3 to 5 percent. Minus 3 to 5 percent. We have something to pray about. Can you say amen? amen? We have a mission. We have the Father's business. And Houston International, we can make a difference yes. for God. Yes. We have to step out of our selfishness and out of our materialism and of our thirst and our thrust yes. to yes. shine yes. and bring glory to Almighty God. Yes. We need to change our prayer and pray differently. Instead of praying about my own business, start praying about the Father's business. And God said that those that honor me, yes. I will honor. Yes, you cannot do anything for God without some of the blessing rolling off on you. Amen. You cannot. Amen. But when we become self-focused and self-centered and self-fixated, and it's me, myself, and I, then we are in trouble. Mine eyes have seen the glory. Amen. of the coming of the Lord. Oh, yes. We need to sing again, we have this hope Amen. that burns within my heart. Yes. Hope in the coming of the Lord. Amen. We have this faith that Christ alone impart. Can you say amen? Yes. We need to let our children believe again amen. so that they can preach again. Can you say amen, people? Amen. Am, am I reaching somebody? Amen. Amen. 
and it can happen. It can. I'm sitting down soon. I'm sitting down. I think I told you this story before. Like telling it. Teaching a class, Northern Caribbean University. Bible class. A youngster came in, in the class. 16, 17 years old, a millennial, showing no interest in Bible class until I decided when it was time for presentations and assignment, I decided to give him the hardest assignment. I gave him the sanctuary to present at 17. Are you hearing me? And I thought that I could teach him a lesson. But the boy went, I gave him one month to prepare. He went home and prepared. And he came back and taught the class for one hour and yeah. put us to shame. Wow. Yeah. By using methods and technology of teaching I did not know about. Wow. I sat in class and started taking notes on him. Yeah. And decided that next time I teach, that boy is not going to out-teach me. Because yeah. I did not know what he knew. But he went home and researched. Amen. Because in order to present, you have to know. Yes. And he prepared and structured and delivered the sanctuary in a way that changed the entire class. Amen. And his parents came to me in excitement. I didn't know there were workers on campus. They said, we thought we had lost our boy. Because he was no longer going to church. He would not come to worship. And he was not reading the Bible. But you gave him an assignment. And he started researching and asking my husband and I questions we cannot answer. Wow. And we are Adventists all our lives. And he took an interest in that research and taught my class the sanctuary. And I, as a doctor, had to take notes on him. Let the millennials, let our young people get involved. So that God's church can shine. Amen. God bless. Let's rise while we sing SDH six three three.